It's such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. I really uh, am excited to be here. I want to talk about something that we all share in common. Uh, what we do every single day of our work, which is to deal with complexity. And, and that's what we do for a living, isn't it? We go to work, we solve problems. We create more problems maybe at the end of the day and then come back and solve it the next day. Um, I was on a flight and a guy sitting next to me asked me what I do for a living. I said, I'm a programmer. He said, that's the easiest job on earth. I said, I'm so glad somebody thinks that way. But can you tell me why? He said, because all you have to know is zeros and ones. I said, you're absolutely right. But do you know why they pay such a big buck to do this? He said, why? Because we figure out in which order to put them together. Um, it is a complexity we have to deal with. And I'm going to say, in this room in front of us, we have something probably the most complex ever, which is the human brain. And the human brain is fascinating for two different reasons. One is, it's probably the most capable. We can imagine things, we can innovate things, we can figure out things. But at the same exact moment, we also get very tangled up. We get confused. We get emotionally attached to things, and we wake up with a in our head, and we're not able to think clearly. And it's very fascinating that in that little brain goes both of those at the same time. And uh, when I talk to my children oftentimes, they are very familiar with the word called Schrodinger's cat. Um, Schrodinger wants to imagine that what if there's a cat and there's violin in the, in the box? You can't really see through, you cannot hear. At any given time, maybe the cat is both alive and dead. You know, a lot of times life is kind of like that. You think about things as two different states altogether, not really clear which one we are in. But I want to talk about complexity. Well, they say life is really simple, but we insist on making it really complicated. So did Confucius say. But I'm going to start with the question, why? Why do we really make things complex? I think I have an answer for you. It feels good. It really feels good when you make things complex, isn't it? Let's be honest about it. Deep down, you will tell me it feels really good. You are solving this particular problem. You go to your colleague and you show the result you have done. Your, your colleague looks at it and says, yeah, I get it. It's simple. You feel really let down. You're like, let me come back tomorrow. I'll come back with a complex solution. There is another reason why we make things really complex. And honestly, this is a very important reason. It's job security. Because, you know, when it comes to times to lay off people, they always say, don't touch Joe, because nobody has a clue what Joe is doing. So that gives us job security as well when we make things really complex. But unfortunately, though, when things become really complex, it becomes really hard to maintain them as well. Looks like the screens are out, if you can take a look at why, why that. Oh, it's actually too dim, that's what it is. OK, that's complex right there. So uh, Einstein said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger more complex and more violent, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. I want to highlight the word courage over there. And in fact, that's one of the biggest challenges is we feel insecure a lot of times. We need courage to stand up and say, no, I am not going to make this any more complex. To stand up for simplicity requires that courage, and that's really hard to achieve a lot of different times. So we want to really work towards being, making things simple. Well, if simple, was sitting, if simple was sitting next to you in a bus or a train, would we even be able to recognize what simple really is? And that's one of the challenges I face a lot of times when I work with developers, is everyone agrees that things have to be simple. We cannot really define what simple means in a given context. That becomes really hard. Recognizing simplicity is often really not that simple. So we'll talk about simplicity, but it Turns out it's not that easy to talk about it. So maybe I thought, I'll talk about what's not simple. And if I talk about what's not simple, maybe we'll recognize them and maybe try to avoid them as we go into the future. So let's talk about what's not simple. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is, simple is not clever. How many times have we written something that we feel is very clever? Almost all the time, isn't it? And we write something clever, and then it comes to bite us back after a while. Reminds me of an experience I had not too long ago. I had a, a request from a client saying something is really not right, need to be fixed. I look at the problem. It would have taken me 10 minutes to solve the problem. I said to myself, oh no, I'm not going to solve the problem. I'm going to solve the mother of all problems. I'm going to solve it so cool that not only will this problem be fixed, 
but a family of problems like this would be fixed. So I spent the hour fixing the problem. And when I finished it, I had an out of body experience. I had Venkat get up and hug me from the back and said, you're awesome. It felt that good. About two weeks later, I got an email from the client saying something absolutely disastrous has happened in production. I replied to them saying, I'll fix it. They said, oh yeah, of course you will fix it because we know you are good. I said, no, 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 I can fix it not because I'm good. I'll fix it because I'm the one who caused it. And the little clever solution I had created had totally backfired in ways I never imagined. What did I do? I rolled back the changes I put in, put that 10 minute solution that was in place in the beginning, and I've never heard from them again ever since about this problem. I learned the hard lesson. These days when I write a code, my little brain tells me that's clever, I delete it immediately and I start over. I don't want clever solution, I want clear solution. Well, take a look at this example here for a minute. I think we should dim the light a little bit. It's too, a little too dark for the screen. So um, if we look at this code right here, uh, could somebody help me to dim the lights, please? Um, so if uh, you look at this here, the enum e extends enum e, well, wait a minute. What does it really mean? Thank you. What does it really mean uh, enum e extends enum e? That kind of weird, isn't it? Oh, that little noise you just heard? That's your brain throwing an exception. And it's really hard to comprehend code like this. This is exactly how enum looks like in Java, for example. That's complexity, isn't it? Or, you know, people come to me and ask me, how do we make sure we obfuscate our code? And I often tell them, why do you need an obfuscation tool? Your programmers create code that's naturally self-obfuscated. They themselves cannot understand it tomorrow after they write it. So we tend to really obfuscate and becomes really, really hard to understand over time. And so how do we deal with this? And here's an example of a code I came across. Here's a method called in square root float x. Honestly, I don't have a clue what x is. But notice the second line. We have half of that x, whatever x was. And look at the code, next line. Don't tell me you don't understand this. It would be obvious, right? And then here's some good news. I don't have a clue most of what this is doing, but the good news is whatever is x, it is returned in the end. Well, if you look at this, that takes a lot of time and effort to understand what the code is doing. You know how people tell you that object-oriented code represents the real world? Well, somebody took it to the heart. This guy was developing a flight simulator and created this kind of code. And, and, and somebody should have stopped and said, dude, don't do this. How does anyone maintain code like this, right? Where we get really, really excited. So when, we come, when it comes to being clever, it really hurts us in the long run. So I would say simple is not clever. Another thing I want to emphasize is simple is not necessarily familiar. Humans have a tendency to confuse the word simple and the word familiar. I was told in Norway they use the word optimal for the word simple in English. Well, what is optimal doesn't really mean it is really simple, or, or familiar is not uh, simple. We need to be very careful about what this really means in the context. What is familiar to us is something we are very, very used to. We have seen this a lot of times. We don't have to think twice when we see it. But something familiar may actually be very complex, and we are not even thinking about it in the long run. But on the other hand, something that's not familiar may actually be simple, but we haven't even given a chance to it. We often claim that it's complex because of our human mind fears, drives fears in us, and we think it maybe really is complex. Let's look at this particular word right here. Well, if you, most of us probably would look at this and say, my gosh, that looks really complex. But people who understand the language would say it is actually simple. In fact, it stands for uncomplicated, casual, and common. And, and that's what happens when we are not familiar with something. It drives us crazy, and we think it's actually complex. Let's talk about a fairly simple problem and something we can quickly relate to. I have a list of names here in front of me, as you can see. And all I want to do is print in uppercase, comma separated, all the names that are of the length four. 
how would I write code like this? Almost any language you use, C++, Python, whatever that you may use, I'm using JavaScript here, so let's say far, and what am I going to do? I'm going to say let i equal to zero maybe, let's I say i less than, names dot length maybe, and then i plus plus, hey, that's a very simple for loop, isn't it? Notice how I confuse the word familiar with the word simple. In fact, I would argue this is a very familiar but very complex for loop. Why is it complex? It's got way too many moving parts in it. I got to initialize the i properly, increment it properly, send the boundary properly, and to add insult to injury, it requires a lot more effort as well. Then I could say names.length maybe, or names square bracket i, again, a little bit more complexity there. Length is equal to four. Then what do I want to do? I want to output the names square bracket i dot to uppercase, after all, I want all the values in uppercase. Well, but that's not what the problem said. It wanted the values comma separated. Oh, that is very easy. I can separate them by comma, so I could pretty much put a comma. And you all know that's not quite what we wanted. We want them on the same line. I could say process.std out.write maybe and print it. And then when I'm done with it, you notice there's a stupid comma in the very end. Has anyone ever faced that problem before? <laughs> How did you feel when this happened to you? You said to yourself, this is not happening to me, right? Because it turns out, removing that stupid comma is not that easy. You just stood there and said, huh? And then you're like, how do I remove this comma? And then you came with a clever idea, you said, I will first of all put this into a string and I will strip it out in the end. How did you feel about that? Not so good. And then you said, maybe I'll do something like if i is equal to, uh, you know, i is not equal to something like that, and then, uh, you know, maybe names dot uh, length, and then of course you say, is it minus one after this? And you're not very sure about it. And it turns out, you can do this in an interview. Give this to somebody and watch them suffer, right? And, and this is a very simple problem, would you agree? A trivial problem, but an enormously complex solution. I call these accidental complexity. They are accidental complexity because the problem is not complex, the solution is complex. The solution drags you in, beats you down. At the end of the day, you're like, I'm done, right? But it doesn't have to be this way. Let's try this one more time. After all, I couldn't solve this really well, but let's try this one more time. Let's go ahead and say, uh, I'm gonna output right here, but I'll say names dot, well, I'm gonna do a filter. Given a name, I really want a name dot length is equal to maybe a value of four. Well, this is giving me all the names which are of length four. That's a great first step. I'm gonna do a map operation, give a name. I wanna say name dot to uppercase, convert it to uppercase. Hey, that's a nice second step. Now I wanna say join with a comma. Can you believe it? Just the word join. The day I learned about the join method, I cried that night. I'm like, my goodness, this is the way programming should be. It should be that simple to do. And this is raising the level of abstraction. And this is one of the reasons I'm drawn towards a functional style of programming. And almost every single language today that's worth using has the functional style of programming, including C++, which introduced lambdas uh, not too long ago. So we can do functional style of programming. And inherently, functional style of programming removes a lot of complexity from our shoulders. Now, we as programmers have spent the last 20, 30, 40 years, depending on how long you've been around, coding in the imperative style of programming. But imperative style of programming is inherently more complex than the functional style of programming, and a lot of us are just new to functional style of programming, even though functional style of programming has been around for a very long time. And, and that is one of the things to really consider. Just because something is familiar doesn't mean it's the right solution to use. We may have to go out and look at something very alien, very unfamiliar, but in the end it may be the best thing ever, and we have to really give it a chance to really accommodate it. So not as a very complex uh, you know, problem at hand, but the solution can become really complex. So lots of us are unfamiliar with functional style of programming, very familiar with imperative style of programming, but it turns out the functional style is declarative and a lot simpler. 
And simpler also has fewer moving parts in it. You're not initializing a variable, incrementing the variable repeatedly, and so on. You're not messing with stuff that is variable and changing the state. It becomes a lot easier to work with as well. I'm going to say the third thing is, not only is simple not clever, not only simple is not something that's necessarily familiar, but a simple is not over-engineered. And this is one of the things we do as programmers, is we often do over-engineering of what we do. Why do we do over-engineering? Because we have this desire to create something that is extensible. They say the pathway to hell is created on good intentions. We want to make things extensible, so what do we do? We build all this hierarchy of stuff, and in the end, when it comes time to extend it, the very thing we set out really makes it hard for us to extend our systems. That becomes really, really hard. I remember one experience I had with a developer. I looked at what he had done. He took a data from a database, 250 lines of code to convert it to XML. And I'm like, wow, I read through this code, and I see where this XML is going. And it goes to this other function in the application. And you can imagine what that function did. Parses the XML, and that a little bit of work, and then puts the data back into the database. I'm scratching my head. The data went from here to XML to XML to little transformation in the database. I called the developer and said, I'm looking at this code, and he said, isn't that cool? It's like, no, it's not cool. Why are you converting it to XML and putting it back into the database? He said, Venkat, you need to have a vision. I said, what kind of vision do I not have? He said, the beautiful thing about this code, I said, well, the word beautiful is first questionable, but nevertheless, what is the you know, uh, uh, meaning of this code? Well, the beauty of this is that the data can go anywhere now, and the data can come from anywhere now. I said, wait, 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 let's look at the application we have at our hand. Where does the data come from? Here. Where does the data go? Here. Well, there is no anywhere. The data comes from here and goes here. You know, no, no, you need to have a vision of the future. I said, what kind of vision are you looking for the future? Well, just I told you, it can come from anywhere. It can go anywhere. As he was saying it, I was fiddling with my phone. He said, excuse me, and he said, hello. I said, hello. He said, yes, who is this? I said, hey, how is it going? He said, is that you, Venkat? It's like, yeah. Why are you calling me on the phone? I said, you should have a vision. I could be anywhere and talk to you now. <laughs> Why should I talk to you directly? We should always talk on the phone. That's stupid, isn't it? But that's the whole point. We have this unknown expectation of what extensibility is, and we build the whole damn thing really complex. So the point is, let's not over-engineer. Let's understand the problem at hand first and solve the problem we really know. Well, Rube Goldberg made his name by creating absolutely ridiculous complex solutions. In fact, children in school these days practice developing Rube Goldberg applications just for the fun of it to know how they can create really complex things. I saw my children do this at home. They created extremely complex uh, solutions. I patted them and said, I'm so thrilled to see your teachers are preparing for the real world because that's what we do for a living as well. Only difference is we get paid to create these complex monsters we do. So here is an example of a back scratcher, which is extremely complex. And of course, a series of events happen for this guy back to be scratched. In all honesty, almost everyone in this room, including me, can point to code we have written that is the equivalent of this, right? All this magic happens, and the result eventually gets produced. So we do this quite often in creating applications we do. Well, simple is not necessarily uh, you know, terse. And I want to distinguish between the word terse and the word concise. I want the solution to be concise is not something that is really terse. For example, I came across a product I was working for. This is a client I was working with, and I'm not kidding with you, a single license to this product is a million dollars. It's a very highly intense chemical engineering application. People maintaining this code are PhDs in chemical engineering. They innovate and create algorithms. I was working with this client, and we were just going through code randomly, and, I, and they opened a file, they showed me something, they moved on, I said, oh, whoa, 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 go back to this file, and he did. I said, do you mind if I take a photo of this? He said, sure, sure, go ahead and take a photo of it, but never tell anybody where you got this code from. I said, I promise I will never tell anybody. And they were very kind for me to 
you know, take the folder. So I took the photo of that code and here it is. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to really show you. What I want to show you was the full photo I took. It is what this line was and right below it was this line. God help me, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> and, and somebody, this was a developer who had written this comment in code. And you can imagine going to work every day having to maintain that code. And I think we all relate to this very nicely, right? Because we see this every single day. You're looking at this code and you're asking, what does this, all these variables mean? Because somebody wrote this code. You know, people ask me these days, what do you do for a living? I quit telling them I'm a programmer. I tell them I'm a software archeologist because I go to work and try to figure out what this code actually meant once upon a time when they wrote it because we can't just simply seem to figure it out. So here's a little example of a code and we can argue this is verbose with a try and a catch and all those good stuff. Maybe we should make it really concise. And you've probably seen examples like this in .NET and in Java, and I would claim that this is really a bad example because this is not a concise code, it's a terse piece of code. What I really want to make sure is a code really passes tests for one reason and the right reason. This can actually pass for the wrong reasons. So I don't want terseness or conciseness or cuteness to lead me in the wrong direction. Any day I would rather use a verbose code that is correct than a concise or a terse code that is actually incorrect. And so as a result, a better way is a lot of languages are moving in this direction where we can actually write lambdas to really isolate the code and test it separately, and this could be both concise and also correct at the same time. So we should really not get infatuated by reducing the number of lines of code. We do that also sometimes to say that I really want to create a concise code. Well, correctness is more important than conciseness as well. So don't confuse terse code with simple code and, and concise code. That's very important. Well, here's a quote from Tony Hoare. I'm really uh, uh, you know, um, uh, pretty happy with particular per code because I really appreciate what he says here. And it says there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other is to make it so complicated there are no obvious deficiencies. And, and we see this a lot of times. The code is so complex, we don't even know if it's broken, and that can be really, really hard. I remember being at a client site, I was looking at a piece of code, doing a code review, and I found there was actually a concurrency issue right there, a variable totally unprotected. When I found this, I called the team and said, hey, you guys are doing multi-threading, this this particular variable is totally unprotected. Uh, multiple threads could access this. Are you aware of it? And before I could finish it, one of the developers got really angry at me and said, hey, Venkat, this code has been in production for three years. What makes you think you can come and scare us today? Thankfully, I didn't have to answer it. Before I could say anything, one of the other developers said, oh, but wait a minute. Every three weeks, the program crashes. We don't know why. And, and so we could really have problems in systems and not even know why there are issues that we have to deal with. So, okay, we talked about what is not simple. Simple is not clever. Simple is not necessarily familiar. Simple is not over-engineered. We talked about a few things. It's not necessarily terse, but we don't want to leave without talking what really is simple. So it would be nice to really think about what maybe is in the range of something that is simple. So let's try that. So, well, what is then simple? I'm going to start by saying the first thing, probably the most important is, simple keeps us focused. One of the biggest challenges we deal with today in the world we live in is to keep focus. Uh, the most precious thing today is people's attention because we have so many distractions in front of us. You sit with the code, and if you're going to take a very long time figuring out what the code is, it is a distraction. And also, very quickly we get dragged into things. How many times have you sat down with a problem and two hours later you have really got into the real problem because you've been distracted so many times along the way? And this can be really, really hard in what we do. Let's talk about an example of focus, if you will. So let's say we are working on a particular piece of code, and you're not sure exactly what function to call. So what is the most logical thing to do today? You would say, dude, why don't you just search for it? Well, it makes sense. I want to quickly search for it. Maybe I don't know what function to call. Maybe I will just do a quick search for it. Well, of course, to do the search, I need to bring up the browser. So here we go. Let me bring up the browser and do the search for it really quickly. And oh, wait. Um, 
Trump is in real trouble yet again. This man is unstoppable. Do you think do you feel that way too? My goodness, it's pretty interesting how things are. Uh, oh, there's about something about Norway here. How regular people can become rich in Norway. How curious, should, should we click on that link? Uh, how to become rich, normal people can become rich. This is I mean, awesome. Let's, you know what just happened, right? I went to search for an API and totally got derailed. This is a problem where the search box is right there, but I didn't even look at the search box. I got completely hijacked, and 20 minutes later, I'm like, what API was I working on? Well, okay, maybe that's something we should really rethink about it. Let's try again. Maybe I shouldn't use Yahoo Search for that reason. Let's use Bing. Hey, that's a beautiful, oh, wow. Look at that form land, that's really awesome. Little green patches, you know, some of them are squares, some of them are circles. I just often see them when I'm on a flight, very interesting. I kind of wonder where this form land is from. I want to search for it, but I'm really, really scared because that may take me in a vicious cycle. Another picture may show up. You know, let's try this one more time. Here is Google. And what does Google say? What are you here for? To search. Well, then search. There is nothing else. Nothing else I can do. Do you think this was really simple? The day this is, can you imagine? Just close your eyes and think about this day. The guy walks up to his boss and says, I've created the search page. Let me see it. And he shows the search page, and the boss says, yeah, really? What is it? Where, where's stuff? Yeah, that's it. In fact, I put a button called, I feel lucky. Well, you should feel lucky to have a job. <laughs> Honestly, folks, how many of us in this room will have courage to create this? The word is courage, isn't it? How many of us will have the courage to create this and say, that's it. I am not going to distract the user. Right behind that click is enormous complexity of servers and cloud and algorithms and machine learning, and you can put more terms to it. But I'm not going to push any of that complexity to the users who came here to search. How many of us use Google? There's a reason for it, right? Because you value something very important to you, which is your time, your focus. And that is the reason we go there every single day. Because it says, mind your business. What are you here for? If you're here for searching about what Trump said, or if you want to know how to get, get quick in Norway, I got a news for you. Search for that. I am not going to distract you by giving stuff that is not relevant to you. And to me, that is something extremely critical, extremely valuable. And I have one word for that kind of simplicity. It is called respect. You are respecting your users. And I value that kind of respect because you are saying, I value your time, I value your focus, I'm gonna get you what you are here for and not distract you from that. And that is exactly what we need to do when we create our APIs. How many times have you looked at your API where the function says int p1, int p2, int p3, and you're like, God help me here. What do these three ints mean? I don't have a clue, I have to search for a documentation at this point. So keeping the focus is incredibly powerful. Uh, here's another wonderful quote. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there, uh, when there is nothing left to take away. What if we can remove all the clutter from around us, all the things that distract and take our focus, and so we can come down to the bare minimum that will keep our focus and get our work done? I would say, in all respect, that is simplicity, and I want to go towards that. So simplicity eliminates accidental complexity and hides the inherent complexity from us so we can manage our day's work and focus on what we do. The next thing is simple fails less. Simple actually fails a lot less. Now, let's take one little exercise here. This is a manhole, and it's a circular in size. We've all seen this. As we walk through the streets, we see this all the time. I could ask you the question, why is this circular in its shape? And pretty readily, most of us would probably say, oh, it's circular because uh, it is not going to fall in. And uh, the circle fits really nicely with the circle. That answer is correct. But there is actually always the rest of the story to every story, isn't it? So yes, you are right. It's circle and it won't fall in. 
But let's step back for a minute. You can do this as an exercise. Send out a request for proposal and tell your word of consultants and your companies to say, build me something that is going to not fall in. I will bet you very few will come with a circle. You know why? Because you cannot charge them more if it is really simple. And most likely the solutions you will come up with these different solutions. You know why? Because each one of them also have the property, they will not fall in as well. And so the chances are the designs you will see will not be as simple as that because the design satisfies the requirement, things don't fall in and every one of them don't fall in also. So there is yet another reason why circle is really awesome. These things don't fall in too, so why can't we just use any of these? There is a very important reason why we don't want any of these because at the end of a very long day, if you have a team coming out of that hole and the last person who comes out says, dude, how do I put this on this particular lid on this? Just roll the damn thing, let's go home, is a really good answer. A circle fits in any direction you roll it in. That's not true with any of these other shapes as well. So the simplicity has yet another meaning to it. It fails really less. It doesn't matter how you roll it, it becomes really easy to roll it on it. So it's very easy to understand, easy to work with. And I remember this, I, was, I had worked the entire night. I had worked absolutely the entire night. I know it was very unsafe for me to drive this morning, but I was driving that morning and I was running out of gasoline on my car. So I pulled over to fill the gasoline and I was so tired I could barely keep my eyes open. I took the nozzle and I'm trying to insert into my car. It just would not work. And after about a minute or so, I'm almost in tears now because I'm so tired. I said, why wouldn't this work? Why don't even know how to fill up gasoline? Let me stop and think, and that's when I found out I had pulled over to a diesel station. My car was not diesel. Can you imagine, had they not prevented me from filling diesel into my car, I would have had a broken car that morning. And I said, awesome, you guys really did excellent in your design because fool like me was prevented from damaging my car today. And again, think about how many ways we can prevent people from failing. Simple really helps us to fail a lot less as well. A simple is elegant. You want elegance as well when you develop things. And why is this the most famous picture ever created? It's a picture of a lady, not a whole lot. And that is the beauty, right? The beauty is not what's in here. The beauty is not what's not in here. No clutter, no unnecessary details. The beauty, the, beauty, the elegance, the simplicity comes from the lack of clutter in here. And this reminds me of an experience I had. I was in Boston. If you ever go to Boston, I would encourage you to do this. I was in Boston, and I was walking through downtown Boston. I was mesmerized by, by a particular building. And I came across this church called the Trinity Church. And I stood there, and I kept staring at the church until my wife said she's going to call the cops if I don't move because I was just absolutely stuck, and I said I would not leave. I'm going to admire at it. Well, what's so beautiful about this church? Honestly, there's not a whole lot beautiful about this church personally, but what I really was misprised is not this church, but there is a building next to this church called the Jan Han Hancock Building. And when the architect of this building wanted to build this construction, the city of Boston said, heck no, because if you build here, the beauty of the church will go down. And the architect challenged the city and said, no, I'm gonna build it here, and when I am done, I will not even touch the church, but the beauty of the church will only be enhanced. And so he did. And that's what really mesmerized me because I was standing next to the Jan Hancock building. My camera doesn't do a good justice to this picture, but if you ever go, you will be absolutely amazed as I was because the reflection of the church from the glasses of the building is just amazingly beautiful. So he built it in an angle where the church is reflected by this building and you could just stand there and I have to say it's much more beautiful to look at the reflection than the church itself and that again is an example of how you could actually build something very simple and at the same time get really aesthetic results out of it as well. So but it turns out 
We can be all desirous to create something like this, but it actually takes time to evolve towards simplicity. Simplicity is not something we're gonna sit down and create right in one shot. Uh, as Richard Feynman said, if you cannot explain something to a first year student, then you haven't really understood it. And that's one of my experiences is, when I'm working with something very complex, I find it really hard to explain. And this is one of the reasons why you always want to create something, then sit down and try to explain it to somebody, and that's when you really figure out what you've created is actually really a monster and not something really simple. Uh, this reminds me of an experience. Uh, Occam's Razor says if you have two equally likely solutions to a problem, you better want to choose the one that is the simpler one. And I was writing this book on functional programming in Java, and as I was writing this book, I got the excitement to write about maybe tail call optimization. Well, tail call optimization doesn't exist in Java. It doesn't exist in Java today, but I still had this desire to show how to do tail call optimization. I had read through some really, really good books. For example, one is the structured and interpretation of computer programs. And this book, they show how to build tail call optimization. They talk about process and procedures and how the optimization can be done. And I have programmed in languages like Clojure and Scala and F Sharp and Groovy. And I have seen how tail call optimization is done in these languages. Some languages do it at the compiler level, some languages do it at the library level. I said to myself, if they can do it, I can do it too. And I wasted two precious days of my life, doing nothing but creating that example. And when I did, I got down to writing a code kind of like this, don't worry about the details of the code, and I spent 10 more hours after the two days, so pretty much I wasted three days of my life. And I came up with that code example. But if you look at this example of the code, right in the middle of it is a while, exclamation call completed, current equals current dot apply, and then it is doing the looping. Hey, it looks reasonable. Wrong, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is, until the page before this page in the book, I kept telling the readers, avoid mutability, avoid mutability, avoid mutability. And I come to this example, and guess what I'm doing? Mutating. And I spent another day trying to remove this mutation from this code, and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out. And then I came up with what I thought was a brilliant solution. And the brilliant solution was to put this code on the book and say a footnote that said, dear reader, do you see I'm using mutability? Turning this code to use non-mutability is left as an exercise for the reader. Yeah. This would have worked 20 years ago because you could write a book and you can hide and nobody would ever find you. In the world of Twitters and Facebook, we can't do this anymore. Because the first time somebody reads it, they're gonna say, oh yeah, can you share with, you, with me your solution? After all, busted. Then I thought, okay, maybe I'll change this answer a little bit. Dear reader, do you see me using mutability? Avoid mutability in all cases, except when you cannot. And that didn't go well, I said, I realized finally after two days of work, another two days of work, I came to this very grim solution. And sometimes this is the hardest of things to ever realize. And I said to myself, my code simply sucks. And I just left it and said, never mind, I will not solve this problem now. And then I was on the treadmill a week later, away from the problem, I was just you know, thinking about something else, and slowly a little thread in my mind, just thinking about this problem. And immediately I, it dawned on me, I said, oh my gosh, I can rethink about this problem as an infinite series problem, and immediately I jumped out of, the, out of the treadmill, ran to my desk, and in 10 minutes I had a solution working, solving this as an infinite stream problem. And so notice in this case what I've done is I said, stream iterate, and then of course filter find first, and because of lazy evaluation, we can actually solve problems like this without mutability. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to really realize there is actually a simpler solution. And oftentimes that's when you're away from the computer. When you're taking that beautiful hike around the mountains or you're trying to really do your chores and do your dishes is when you really figure out solutions. When you're, your mind is complex, it gets tangled in a problem. You spend three hours and getting frustrated and then you walk away and 20 minutes later, you're like, 
gosh, why didn't I think of that solution? And that's the fascination of the complexity of our brain is we are so beautiful, we are so clever, and yet we are so stupid. All in the same body that we carry around, isn't it? It's just amazing that we can actually do that. So Einstein said, of course, everything should be made simple as possible, but not any simpler. But I always wonder, when I create something, have I created something simple? And somebody else looks at my code and says, but why didn't you do this? And I'm like, oh, of course, why didn't I think of that? And now I have a simpler solution than I had thought about. And the fellow developer comes and makes it simpler for me. That's one of the reasons why I like people looking at my code, like people looking at what I do, because they help me remove the complexity that my mind puts into it. And I do the same thing for others, too. When I look at their code, I can help them make things simpler for them as well. So is what I create a simple, or is it really complex? And I think that simplicity is kind of like the Schrodinger's cat. The solution we create is simple and complex at the same time. It is simple for what we know right now, but it could be simpler when somebody else maybe comes along and removes certain burdens we carry with us. So this is one of the challenges we deal with every single day. We want to really remove the complexities, especially the accidental complexities that we come across. We should really put the effort to remove it. And simple makes things really easy, but as it turns out, it's not easy to make things simple at all. It is something that takes a lot of effort to really make things simple. It takes effort, but also don't forget, it also takes courage to make things simple, things simple too. Oftentimes we get ridiculed for making things simple. We need to stand up and have the courage to make things simple as well. As Da Vinci put it, I'm going to end by saying simplicity is the ultimate sophistication in life, and that is true for programming as well. Every bit of effort we put in to make things simple is actually well worth it. Hope that was useful. Thank you.